The views, opinions, and representations expressed on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network and its website are those of the hosts, guests, and participants, and are not necessarily those of or endorsed by the network, its affiliated stations and broadcasts, the management, other hosts, or advertisers of the network. The shows found on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network can, but do not necessarily, promote any particular lifestyle, belief, religion, political affiliation, or other personal practice. These shows are for entertainment purposes only, and are not intended to treat, diagnose, and or claim any cure of disease or condition, or give any medical or legal advice. Coming to you from some far point station, like a cosmic tumbleweed, both north and south of the Pleiades, here's your host, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer. Well, I am back, folks. Thank heavens we are still here on Night Dreams Talk Radio after a couple weeks uh, off. Uh, going to various places, and of course, then we had the Snowmageddon before that out here in the Seattle area. So it is just wonderful to be back with you tonight and bring you some really interesting uh, information and uh, paranormal news. Basically, we've got a lot of stuff lined up for you tonight on our show. We've got uh, Peter Davenport, of course, right off the top of the hour with some new sighting reports. We haven't... uh, I've uh, been caught up with Peter here as far as those go, so this is going to be fun. Peter is on the road, by the way, so it's lucky that we snagged him, and uh, we are going to get uh, some updates from him. And then, of course, uh, Vince Inzunza from Pacific North Weird is on the road, as always, and he is going to give us a remote report uh, about the uh, the weird and wonderful things that are going on in our communities and around the United States and the world. So we've got that all lined up. And, of course, my main guest tonight is Robin Murphy, and she is a paranormal mystery writer and author and publisher, and we are going to talk about how you are going to potentially get that story that you've written or your life memoir into print. So I am looking forward to this. Uh, It's going to be a fun show tonight, so sit back, relax, grab yourself some nice uh, hot drink and pull that blankie up tight. We will start the show right away with our friend, our good buddy, Peter Davenport. Hey, Peter. Well, good evening, Michael, and welcome back to the program. Uh, It's nice to have you back after a two-week hiatus, and thank you for mentioning I'm on the road, because that gives me an automatic uh, default, an automatic uh, excuse if anything goes wrong at my end, and I'm <laughs> delighted to be back, and always always delighted to bring the latest UFO material I have to an audience, and I will continue to do so tonight until my cell phone battery gives up the ghost. That's my... Oh. That's all I can promise. <laughs> well, that is wonderful. Now, what, what neck of the woods are you at now tonight? I'm in Albany, Oregon, visiting uh, a cousin and his wife, friends of my, not only cousins and relatives, but uh, good friends of mine. And uh, we're just having a wonderful time unwinding after the last, last weekend's uh, conference up in Ocean Shores. And it was great to see you there. You... By the way, I have to compliment you on the air. You do a wonderful job as the organizer of UFOI team, and you have come miles, country miles, in progressing with that group. Wonderful group of people, by the way. I'd like to compliment them as well. It was wonderful to have a chance to meet a lot of the team you put together. Oh, that was just a great conference. The uh, Quinault Beach UFO Paranormal Summit in Ocean Shores, Washington last weekend. It was huge. We had, uh, gosh, we had Daryl Sims there, the alien hunter. We had uh, Jonathan uh, Dover, uh, the paranormal um, uh, ranger, they call him now, 
uh, used to work on the Navajo Indian reservations, you know, as a law enforcement officer with many, many uh, paranormal and UFO and cryptid stories. That was fascinating. And uh, we had Sarah Nash, Reverend Sarah Nash was there with her amazing consciousness kind of stories. And then, of course, we had Peter Davenport uh, present a very interesting visual about his passive radar system. Peter, I was really impressed on how you did that. Well, thank you very much. That's that's the first time I've ever done that in front of an audience, uh, presenting a very basic illustration of what passive radar is. And uh, I didn't know how it was going to come off, but I had some feedback after the presentation that people seemed to like it principally because it was so simple. And then yes. basically what I said was we are able to use reflected radio, commercial radio and television signals for detecting and tracking UFOs. And it's a concept that came to me, as you heard from my lecture, some 24 years ago, and I'm still trying to sell it to the community, the UFO community. I hope I can build one and detect UFOs directly without the aid of uh, eyewitnesses or fuzzy photographs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a fascinating white paper that you've written on that whole idea. <clears throat> and you came up with this uh, idea, by the way, uh, quite a while ago. When, when did you first write that white paper? Uh, first paper, I came up with the idea in January, late January of, of 1995, just shortly after I had started to taken over, just shortly after I'd taken over the hotline from Bob Gribble. And uh, I talked about it for a long time, but I didn't write an article until about four years later, 1999, and uh, it, it's very interesting, Michael. I proposed a concept that would allow the UFO community to detect UFOs directly, and it was eight weeks before I had any feedback from any of the readers or uh, members of MUFON who had had a chance to look at the article. So it's been a very hard sell, but... Uh, interestingly, as you know, you and I have talked about this incident. In 2004, I was invited to speak at the MUFON Symposium, the annual MUFON Symposium in Denver, held, which is where it was held that year. Uh, John Schusler was the organizer and the international director of MUFON that year. He invited me to speak, and I decided to do something entirely new that didn't have anything to do with talking about UFO sighting reports. And I wrote a paper on the subject of using passive radar for detecting them. The day that paper was published on MUFON's website, as you know from our many conversations on this point, I was contacted by a senior officer at the Central Intelligence Agency who had seen my paper, the abstract of my paper, and called me to congratulate me uh, on my line of reasoning. He said, Peter, if you build the system you describe in your paper, you will be successful in detecting or de answering the question of whether UFOs are real or not. So it was very flattering and very exciting to get a uh, call from a senior CIA officer during business office, uh, business hours back in uh, back in Washington, D.C. So I was pleased to make that presentation last weekend. Oh, yeah. I think you just got to keep doing it. Uh, and eventually uh, some uh, billionaire out there, which we have quite a few of them in the Seattle area, hopefully will uh, step forward with some funds because from what I gather, it's not that expensive to actually build the system. No, it's not expensive at all. The only expensive part is writing the estimated 1 million to 2 million lines of computer code for processing the reflected signals yeah. to be able to make heads or tails out of them. But anyway, that's my dream. And a lot of, if you were to poll 
people who know me and have known me for a long time as to what Peter's greatest contribution in the field of ufology would be. It hasn't been all the 128 or 29,000 reports I've collected. I would argue it's my proposal for using passive radar for detecting UFOs directly. Oh, man, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. That would be wonderful. Matter of fact, you'd be posting on your uh, website the reports before anybody reported them. So <laughs> that'd be turning the exactly. tables on everyone. <laughs> we would be detecting the arrival of UFOs in terrestrial airspace. And oh. I'm very excited. As no yeah. doubt you and our audience members can tell, I'm very excited about the prospect of being able to detect UFOs directly, and I look forward to being able to do that sometime. Oh, that'd be great. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep at it and keep the uh, pressure on them, that's for sure. Well, I, I would imagine, uh, even though you're on the road, and I really appreciate you uh, joining the show uh, while you're out and about traveling, but uh, you might want to give us uh, some sighting reports that you think are important for us to know about. Absolutely, and thanks to the wonders of uh, the electronic age, I was able to access a lot of the reports that have been submitted using our online report form, even though I'm not back at the center. I was able to use a friend's computer and access the uh, access my email. And there's some wonderful reports. The first one I'd like to address, Michael, comes from Columbia, South Carolina, the 26th of February, a Tuesday, I believe that was. A young student writes that uh, on the evening of the 26th of February at 6.25 p.m., he was witness. He was outside uh, in his backyard, and he saw a, allegedly saw a saucer-shaped object, metallic in color, I don't know what that means, but I suspect that it means either the color of aluminum or silver or stainless steel hovering motionless in the nighttime sky. And it had a cupola on top of it, as is so often reported by people who see these craft of this shape. He estimates he saw it for somewhere between two to five minutes. He's, he didn't time it. But uh, very interesting sighting, and if it's a sincere report, uh, he had a very interesting sighting indeed. He estimates that the object was approximately 20 feet long or a little bit shorter and 10 to 15 feet wide, or uh, rather, excuse me, 10 to 15 feet tall. I'm reading from his report. So... That was Columbia, South Carolina, on the 26th of February. Very interesting report. All right. Uh, the second one I'd like to uh, cite before we go into uh, discussion of it is a sighting over up in your territory, neck of the woods, Maple Valley, Washington. A gentleman who described himself as uh, being in his 50s, a very sober and sane individual, on the 28th of February, Thursday morning at 5.59 p.m., noted a very bright light in the eastern sky that was going from his right to his left, so headed generally north. And the thing that shocked him is how much of the sky the light covered in just a matter of, he estimates he was watching it for 8 to 10 seconds. It covered approximately... I have to estimate the the arc, but between 90 and 120 degrees of arc in approximately eight seconds is his estimate. And what makes it very interesting as well is that the object appeared to accelerate while he was watching it. A meteor would not... 